Well, in the beginning, there was Woodrow Wilson. He assented to the Balfour Declaration under political pressure from Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who was the American-born son of Czech Jews and president of the American Committee for Zionist Affairs. Now, FDR didn't worry about Palestine all that much because he had much bigger things to worry about at the time, but he worried about Palestine because the king of Saudi Arabia worried about Palestine. And FDR was planning to make the kingdom America's strategic oil reserve after the war. At the same time, FDR was reminded by the Zionist Review, a New York paper in 1945, that tilting toward the Palestinians to, oppose the, to, to appease the Saudis would be political suicide in America. Well, President Truman agreed, saying to critics like Marshall and Forrestal, I'm sorry, gentlemen, but I have to answer to hundreds of thousands who are anxious for the success of Zionism. I don't have hundreds of thousands of Arabs among my constituents. The 1948 war, Israel's expulsion or liquidation of the Palestinians and the assassination of Count Folk Bernadotte internationalized the Palestinian question to America's great disadvantage. Now all Arab governments in the region took this Palestinian question as their touchstone and made it sort of the focus of all their relations with America. President Eisenhower, who vowed to downgrade Israel to improve America's total situation in the Middle East, also keeled over under the lobbying pressure at home. There are five million Jewish voters in the US, he sighed, and very few Arabs. British ambassador in Washington was astonished by this. The Americans, he wrote, crave oil and strategic space in the Cold War but they refused to coax the concessions from the Israelis that would lodge them more securely in that space. Tel Aviv, meanwhile, demands and gets an American security guarantee of their borders without any sacrifice at all." Unquote. LBJ, of course, paid little attention to the Middle East. Everything to do with the Middle East must be subject to events in Southeast Asia, as his Secretary of State, Dean Russ, said. When he did pay attention, he viewed the region like Truman, a place where he could win Jewish votes in US elections. Nixon called the failure of his predecessors to solve the Palestinian land and refugee problems one of the major lapses of the post-World War II era. His first Secretary of State, William Rogers, the first diplomat to use the term Palestinian instead of the Israeli-favored term refugee, tried to roll back the Israelis but was immediately stymied by Golda Meir, who drove a wedge between the friendly U.S. government of Nixon and the hostile State Department of Rogers another tried and true Israeli gambit. Ginger assured Nixon that he'd be able to manage the Israelis. Of course, he wasn't. They crossed the Golan Heights, they crossed the Suez Canal, provoking a major Cold War crisis. They can't do this to us again, Henry Nixon wailed. They've done it to us for four years, but no more, as if. Paradoxically rewarded Israeli intransigence after the war with 2.2 billion in new military aid. Nixon and Kissinger reinforced the Kennedy tendency. We must let Israel use weapons to produce security. It seemed that the only way to manage the Israelis in a US political environment that made real negotiation or sanctions impossible was to give them more stuff, arms and money, and merely hope that they'd give a little to get more. 